Hello, good uh, good afternoon if you're on the East Coast, and uh, good morning if you're way out west. I know we always have some friends from Hawaii tuning in. Uh, you are listening to Post-Secondary Institutions Business Considerations, uh, part of the Higher Education Webinar Series brought to you by the law firm of Thompson Coburn, and today co-sponsored by Capstone Partners, which we're delighted to uh, have our friends from Capstone here. I'm going to go ahead and get started. This is Aaron Lacey your host and moderator for the series, uh, and just go through some of our housekeeping while folks are still joining. Um, as many of you know, if you've listened before, we've got a nice interface here that has some options for you. So uh, if you have questions during the webcast, and we are going to try to get some questions in at the end, you can submit them through the Q&A widget that's at the bottom of your screen. As I mentioned, we'll try to answer as many of these as we can towards the end of the webcast. Uh, a copy of today's slide deck is available in the resource widget. You're going to see links to uh, two or three articles and websites we think are pretty interesting. Those are live links, so when you pull down the slide deck uh, in PDF version, you should be able to click those links and go to those websites. If for some reason you can't, just let us know, and we'll make sure you get those. Um, and you can find additional answers to some common technical issues located in the help widget also at the bottom of your screen. This webinar today is CLE accredited in California and Illinois for 1.5 hours of general CLE credit, and in Missouri for 1.8. Uh, because in Missouri, you know, we work harder, so we get more CLE. I don't think that's true. Uh, 1.5 hours of general CLE credit in Texas is still pending, and 1.8 hours of general CLE credit in New York is pending. But if you're in one of those jurisdictions or elsewhere and you're looking to get CLE credit, um, please let's make sure that you do because we want you to. Uh, keep in mind we award CLE based on attendance for the entire 90 minutes. Um, from time to time, you may be required to click a pop-up screen just to reflect your continued engagement. And finally, as always, uh, we would love for you at the end, there will be a survey and deeply appreciate the feedback we get. We do read all the surveys and we do try to take that feedback and to make every presentation better than the one before. So. Thompson Coburn, if you don't know, if you're new to us, is a law firm uh, here uh, domestically in the U.S. We have offices all over the place. We're headquartered in St. Louis, but we're in Chicago and New York and L.A. and D.C. and places like that. Um, and we have a higher education practice. I'm the chair of that practice, uh, which provides legal counsel, compliance, training services, all those kinds of things to all different kinds of colleges and universities. Uh, we spend a lot of time giving what I'll call sort of business and operational advice. And one of the things our practice really focuses on uh, are sort of enterprise level events like mergers and acquisitions and complex substance of changes. I uh, mentioned earlier, the webinar today is co-sponsored with our friends from Capstone Partners. Uh, so Capstone Partners is among the largest uh, independently owned investment banking firms in the United States. Uh, and they were founded, as it says on the slide, to serve the needs of middle market enterprises and do a lot of work with institutions of higher education. Headquartered in Boston and Denver, you can see the pictures over there, both just really beautiful cities. Uh, they have an education and training group that's uh, really dedicated to working with institutions and on education-related matters that also has extensive experience in structuring, negotiated transactions, um, and, and these days has branched out and is doing a lot of work um, just assisting institutions in addition to substantive changes and mergers and acquisitions, also with um, internal operational and financial evaluation and reform and innovation. And we're going to talk about all that stuff today. Um, this is part of our higher ed webinar series. If you've tuned in over the last two or three years, you know we typically try to track the series uh, with the academic calendar. This year, uh, coming out of uh, COVID and 2020 uh, into this year has been a little wonky. We haven't been quite as consistent every month as we have, as we have been in years past. Um, but I think ultimately we have managed to get in uh, eight or nine webinars over the fall. Uh, in spring and into the summer here. And we are really excited about launching our next series in the fall, so keep an eye out for that. If you've missed one of our sessions and you'd like to go back and listen, they are all available on our website, uh, Thompson Coburn's website in our library. And I'll have a slide here for you at the very end that'll get you up to speed on that. Um, so from Capstone, we have a couple of people joining us today. Uh, first is Mr. Jack Bradley, our friend and managing director of the Financial Advisory Services uh, over at Capstone Partners. Um, Jack has been in the business for a very long time, 30 years of experience uh, working in a variety of industries, including 
higher education, and I know right now, and we've talked about this, uh, Jack, that you are spending a lot of time working uh, with schools, again, on sort of internal reform and thinking about what are opportunities to improve uh, operational and financial efficiencies, uh, or potentially to improve those um, and to work towards transaction. Uh, we also have uh, Mr. Jacob Voorhees, uh, or Jake Voorhees will go by uh, either. Uh, Jacob, I don't know, I'm not seeing your picture here. It seems to have disappeared from our panelist profile. I'm gonna go back one and see if we can reload the picture again and if it'll pop. You're too handsome. You're so handsome well, it, it you probably, broke the platform. It's probably better for everyone. <laughs> it's probably, as, as mom used to say, a face for radio. No, that's not, that's not true. Jake, Jake is a very handsome guy. Uh, and I don't know why our picture disappeared. I could see it in one, one of the smaller screens, but for some reason it's not popping up here. You can Google him online, Jacob Voorhees, if you'd like to see his mug. Uh, Jake is a founding member of Capstone Partners and for the last 15 years has been the head of their mergers and acquisitions practice within the education and training group. So um, Jacob has lots of experience uh, working, again, with institutions specifically on large enterprise level substantive transactions like mergers and acquisitions. Um, we have Ms. Katie Wendell, who is uh, an attorney and counsel here at Thompson Coburn and works in the higher education practice along with me and several others. Um, Katie, in addition to being an attorney in the space for uh, the last 12, 13 years, actually ha is educated and has an MS in higher education administration, so has been in and around higher ed in various capacities uh, and handles lots of work uh, for institutions, uh, particularly of the regulatory and transactional variety. And we partner regularly on, again, uh, lots of business and sort of uh, enterprise level type events um, for institutions of all types and all sectors. And then finally, you've got me, your fearless or not so fearless moderator, the chair of uh, the higher ed practice here at Thompson Coburn, where I lead our, our transactional practice among other things. So I just wanted to start today um, briefly, and again, I, it looks like for some reason we're losing some of our graphics here. I'm hoping that doesn't happen too frequently, but fortunately this isn't a big deal. I'm, and certainly fill you in on our syllabus. We really just have uh, four cat sort of categorically speaking things we're going to talk through. Um, I'm going to start out with just a little bit of an overview uh, relating to sort of the challenging times we're experiencing in higher education right now. And, and I'm just going to spend five or ten minutes doing that tops because really the point here is to tee up a, conver a panel conversation for uh, Jack and Jacob uh, and Katie. And we're going to talk about a lot of what we're seeing and has been occurring and some of the work that they've been doing and the types of opportunities that have been available to institutions. Just all those kinds of things uh, because it is a dynamic time right now. Uh, I do think things are changing and changing fairly dramatically in higher education. Uh, and um, uh, that is prompting a lot of institutions to evaluate uh, sort of their operations and their financial position and their future. And so we're interested in like I said, I'm talking about all of that. Um, so just as a way of setting the stage a little bit, challenging times in higher education. Many of you know, and if you've uh, been following our webinars for the last couple of three years, you may have seen this slide before, um, but I think it's important to note that even before the pandemic, right, I mean, higher ed sort of coming out of the, you had the 2007 financial uh, collapse, and then as the, the market struggled and folks left jobs and businesses closed, actually higher education had uh, a real enrollment boom. And so between about 07 and 2012, uh, a lot of institutions experienced significant increases in enrollment and, and candidly did quite well as folks went back to school and retrained, et cetera. But then capping out and sort of topping out in sort of 2011, 2012, after that point, uh, enrollments really started to decline um, nationwide across all sectors of higher ed. And then along with that, some schools, when things were going well, had taken on a lot of debt that they'd been, had trouble uh, uh, serving to try to increase enrollments and become more competitive, particularly in traditional higher ed. You saw a fair amount of tuition discounting. Unfortunately, that cuts into revenues, of course, which doesn't help with uh, debt problems and continued declines in enrollment. You have had a lot of regulatory burden and inconsistency as we swung back and forth from one administration to the next. Um, you all know if you are in-house at an institution and have been over the recent years, you know, as soon as you spend all that money and time and human uh, capital to try to get in compliance with some big new regulatory framework, it goes away and it's replaced with another one. Um, terribly inefficient for institutions. 
you know, occasionally there's just some good old-fashioned poor management in the space. Um, there's been some cultural shift as well, uh, and we've seen change in student demographics, particularly in the northeast of the country, where um, sort of traditional uh, college-age students have been dwindling in numbers. And what's interesting is, and we're going to talk about closures in a little bit, but a, a higher percentage of institutional closures, particularly in traditional higher ed, have actually occurred up in the Northeast. And then finally, there's been um, some international student decline. I, I think that depends on where in the country you are, but certain markets certainly have seen a decrease in interest. Um, that may reverse, but all of these things taken together, even before the pandemic, were causing a lot of consternation, self-reflection, and concern for institutions of higher ed. And, and it was such was the case that um, a lot of folks started tracking closures and thinking about what was going on. I have a couple of slides here just to put a finer point on it. You know, when you look in the for-profit space, I'm going to do nonprofit in a minute, but, you know, the National Center for Education Statistics, NCES, tracks institutions, um, meaning how many there are, how many students they have, et cetera, and, and they've got some really fascinating data that shows this, you know, from 07 to sort of 12 and after that and, the, and how institutions increased in, in number and then decreased. And where we really saw this, uh, uh, sort of extraordinary increase and decrease was in the proprietary or for-profit space. So between, I'm going to show you a graphic here in, in, on the next slide that really illustrates this, but between 2001 and 2013, so over about a decade and changed, the number of private for-profit four-year institutions more than tripled um, from 207 to 710, and then it declined over the next five years by more than 40%. And similarly, between 2000, 2001, and 2012-13, and, and the number of private for-profit two-year institutions increased by about 37%, and then over the next five years, decreased by about 23%. And here, you can see I've got the red box around, and this is from NCES, it's a great graphic, uh, the private for-profit dynamics here and what occurred. So, you know, the first, the dark purple is 2000, 2001, and then you see the huge jump among four-year private for-profits from 207 institutions up to 710, and then by 2017, 18, back down to 395. And then on the two-year side over there, you see sort of not quite as dynamic, but a very similar jump there from 480 up to 658. The 505. So, you know, you can measure closures and campuses in different ways, but, but any way you cut it, um, on the for-profit side of the house, we have seen over, I'll say, the last 20 years, you know, this incredible ramping up of the number of institutions and expansion, and then an almost equal contraction over the next six or seven years. Um, but it's not just on the for-profit side of the house, right? It's also on the private nonprofit side of the house. Um, our friends over at Higher Education Dive have been tracking uh, mergers and closures uh, among private nonprofit and public institutions since, since 2016. And in that six-year period, um, they have on their records 69 public and private nonprofit institutions having either closed or merged, which if you've been sort of following higher ed for any extended period of time, you know is highly unusual. I mean, I, don't, I, I, would, I would suggest that there has probably never been a five or six year period um, outside of the last five or six years where that many private nonprofit institutions were going through some form of uh, contraction, right? Uh, and by the way, if you'd like, you can go check out this website. Um, Higher Ed Dive is now also breaking this up by states, and you can see this is a screenshot. Um, it's really interesting to sort of look at that data and, and to see in particular how certain sections of the country have been impacted. I made the comment earlier about the Northeast. And you see a lot of the, uh, the dark purple and the concentration of closures and mergers has been indeed up in the northeastern part of the country. Um, Inside Higher Ed does a survey every year of business officers, and the most recent one was done amidst the pandemic. Um, I thought this was also a really interesting slide. So um, they try to measure chief business officers' confidence in the financial stability of their institutions, and they'll ask um, these uh, business officers, you know, how confident are you in your model and your institution's ability uh, over the next five years and then over the next 10 years? And in their most recent survey, which again was taken in the middle of the pandemic, but it's, it was worth noting that the confidence in the five-year outlook dropped a full 10 percentage points from 62% in 2019 uh, down to 52% in 2020. Um, but what's even more interesting is just to note that overall, and, and I'll grant that business officers sometimes can be a pessimistic crowd, but just as a general matter, what it shows you is 
only about half of the business officers out there at institutions of higher education among at least the traditional institutions that are being surveyed here, which is a lot of them. Inside Higher Ed does a good job with the survey. They, they get feedback from a large number of individuals. You know, only about half have confidence in, in the financial stability of their institution over the next five years. And even over the next 10 years, that number is only one percentage higher. So about one in two business officers, at least that responded to this survey, think that their institutions um, may have issues with financial stability over the next five and or 10 years. A couple of other really interesting data points from this survey. Uh, and again, this survey is of traditional higher ed, right? Nearly half of the business officers that responded to the survey said their institutions should use this period to make difficult but transformative changes in their core structure and operations. And just about 5% said that at their college they had had serious internal discussions about merging with another institution. But the proportion of these business officers said they, who said that they thought their institutions should merge was 22%, which I think is sort of an incredible statistic. I mean, that means that one in five of the business officers that were that responded to this survey thought that their institution should merge with another institution. Again, I mean, that's a huge number. You figure there are three to 4,000 traditional institutions of higher education. I mean, just extrapolating, you know, conceivably that's hundreds of institutions where they think they're in need of a merger, uh, if not uh, the nearly half that feel that they're in need of transformative changes. So it really tells you where we are right now with respect to higher ed. And then finally, I thought this was interesting, the last bullet, nearly a third of regional public university business officers said they were open to sharing administrative operations with another institution. So something maybe short of a merger, but, but more than just an internal transformative change, developing some sort of joint operation where they could perhaps create efficiencies or something along those lines. So that brings us to the last slide in this section, which I'll use to sort of tee up the panel conversation, then we're gonna transition. Um, so when we talk with institutions that may be uh, among those 50% thinking they require some sort of transformative change, you know, 20 to 25% who may think that they, uh, you know, should be evaluating a merger, one of the things we often recommend is that they should be contingency planning. And, and our view is at 40,000 feet, there are essentially three sort of avenues that you could go from the point at which you decide, you know, we really need to do something here. Um, and, and by the way, if you're contingency planning, we think it makes sense to be thinking about all three of these simultaneously, even if you only end up pursuing one of them. That's why it's a contingency plan, right? So the first sort of direction, this, is a, this isn't a, uh, you know, the old fork in the road. We've actually got a fork with three, three prongs. So the first is improving operational and financial performance. And this is where, you know, the transformational change, transformative change is really occurring internally. Right, and I know um, Jack is going to talk a, a lot about that today because he's been working a lot with institutions uh, along with the others at Capstone Partners on this sort sort of first piece. Right, what can we do without necessarily pursuing a transaction uh, or involving a third-party institution to try to change um, our operations or our financial structure, et cetera, um, to improve the business? Right, the business of higher education. Um, the second prong in, is involving potentially a third institution or a third party, uh, an outside institution, and that's what we'll call the transactional alternative. Now, that could be a merger and acquisition, and again, Jacob does lots of this work, and we do here at the firm as well. Um, but it also could be something more along the lines of that partnership that was uh, referenced in the prior slide, where you know, you're engaging in some sort of affiliation agreement or, or partnership agreement with another institution to share services or something along those lines, short of an actual merger or acquisition. And the third bucket, which we are not going to talk about today, but if you are uh, at this type of point in the road and you are engaged in contingency planning, we think you should always at least include in the scope of what you're thinking through would be the, the option for the orderly closure uh, or potential teach out of campus. So having said all of this, sort of um, thought about where we are as a higher education community and, and having set the stage here to think through these, uh, at least the two prongs we're going to talk about today in the fork, uh, improving operational financial performance or the transactional alternative. We'll segue into the, uh, the panel discussion. So Katie and uh, uh, Jack and Jacob, again, thank you guys so much for being here. I'm going to start this first question. Um, 
in our improving operational and financial performance. And, I'm, and Jack, I'm going to kick it over to you, along with if you have any introductory remarks, of course. But, but the first question I want to pose to you, you know, how are efforts to understand and improve operational and financial performance, which I know you've been involved in extensively? How is that process and the, these efforts, how are they different when you're dealing with institutions of higher education as opposed to, you know, similar types of efforts in other industries? Jack, are you there? <laughs> it's very quiet. Maybe you're on mute. Sorry, oh, I'm but back. Jacob. Oh, there he is. Oops. There we go. I'm back. Sorry about <laughs> that. So it, it's a great question, Aaron, and I think it's something we keep in mind a lot as we're approaching individual situations. I, I think the, there's a couple of overriding factors that we need to address in these engagements. Just some stakeholders are just more resistant to change, and that can be driven by a number of things. It can be Maybe the devotion to the mission can obscure the scope of the problem. That's not necessarily a, a fault. It's just the way someone is approaching a situation. Um, I think another factor is the consensus-driven decision-making progress that you process around higher ed. Um, I think partly is driven by maybe silos within an organization, and that can limit consensus initially and sometimes find it can entrench competing interests. Uh, but I think a combination of all these factors lead to extended cycle times for making decisions. I will say that I think that is probably more visible in nonprofit situations. I think in what we see in for-profit situations, the economic interests are better aligned. So I think people will be easier to bring along and motivate and, and help change things. But I think that the resistance to change is really something that's kind of systemic to the nonprofit se sector. Yeah, ab absolutely. So is it fair to say when you all are working with uh, an institution, traditional higher ed, I suppose one of the first things you have to do is sort of sit down with the institution and and determine what are the various constituencies, you know, what is the decision making structure, and then and figure out how to marshal those resources together and 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 find the path forward for so that you can actually make decisions and and affect change. Well, that's right, and that's also a function of the personalities that are involved too. So, I think most of the times we're going to be brought into a situation because the CFO is advocating for change and then we're really working through the cfo and their staff trying to understand the other stakeholders and decision makers that we need to help educate so that we can be making progress yeah hey jacob not to put you on the spot here i know we're going to talk about m a a little bit later but do you find in the m a context that it's, I would think that it's probably a similar type situation, right? Whether you're talking about internal uh, changes or you're talking about sort of working through a, a, a transaction, either way, when you're in the context of traditional higher education, you still got those governance complexities and, and the challenges sort of getting everybody on the same page and willing to move forward. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, that's fair. I mean, I think one of you know, the question here is talking about how is this different than other industries? You know, you know, oftentimes you've got two boards um, that are making decisions. And then you also have groups of folks that, you know, don't have really a financial stake in um, the outcome that are voicing their opinion. That's, you know, really alumni, students, and teachers. And, you know, as, you know, decisions are being made to set the, the, the university or the college on, in the right direction, Sometimes this can be viewed um, in the wrong lens from people with a passion uh, for that university or college. Uh, when you know, you're trying to make those decisions for the good uh, of the college, for the viability of the college, and you know everyone thinks that 
you know, you're, you're destroying the college when you're actually doing the exact opposite. Yeah. Oh, I couldn't agree more. I, I mean, I think um, we, we have certainly experienced that in our practice where, and I think in traditional higher education, it's very common to have alumni on your boards and, and to hire alumni into your administration. And to your point, they may actually have a conflict of interest if the outcome of a transaction would result in the end of the institution, right? I mean, apart from some sort of legacy consideration that might be made. Um, and it seems like Sweetbriar, one of the first, you know, years ago uh, in Virginia, one of the first institutions um, to sort of contemplate in a high profile way a closure, despite having resources in their case and, and having some other things going for them, where you had that conflict, right? It's my recollection is the school, the board made the decision to close and then it was the alumni that pushed back very hard and ultimately uh, sort of saw to the institutions I don't know if it was a reopening or continuing um, and sort of overturning that initial initial decision. So, you know, Jack, one of the things you referenced is cycle time. And I was wondering if you could comment just a little bit more on how the the challenge of of getting decisions made and orchestrating these constituencies, you know, you've noted it, it could impact cycle time to decisions and you know how that has impacted you all in your practice and really getting things across the finish line um, and making sure that you have enough runway to get changes made before some sort of adverse outcome occurs. Yeah, I think one way that we try to ensure that happening and, and, and shorten the time as much as we can is really to have a fact-driven presentation, even for stakeholders, even sharing that information with stakeholders who don't necessarily have a dog in the fight, so to speak, but still need to understand, as Jake alluded to, that we're all pushing and pulling and pushing in the same direction to enhance the situation and not pull it down. So yeah. I, I think it's important that you have that transparency and communication so that people see that you're acting collectively in the best interest and at different stages in the transaction, particularly if there's been a maybe if there's been a leak or there's been some rumors that you're trying to get ahead of, um, coming up with just very candid Q and A's is one way to kind of you know anticipate people's questions, but then give them you know the correct answer or not an assumed answer yeah. that fits their that fits their narrative. Yeah, would you say communication is even more important? That like a, a a communication strategy, whether you're doing internal change or whether you're doing um, some sort of external transaction or something like that, it strikes me that having a very sophisticated and sound communication strategy is probably more important in higher education because you have so many constituencies involved than it might be in other types of industries. Yeah. I and the situations I've been involved in have been the most successful has been when there's been a really dedicated communication strategy. And it's not one size fits all because there's the need to maybe bring bring along other members of leadership that might not be focused on things financially, but have more policy or principal goals in mind. And so it's kind of widening the circle as you go forward in the transaction that you're bringing along the your the CFO is bringing along their colleagues and the leadership team and then helping them to push that information down in a transparent way to the direct reports of the leadership team so that it's a constant reiteration of here's where we are, here's why we're doing this, and building consensus that way because otherwise it's almost impossible to achieve the consensus because the silos has caused people to break down into their own narratives and their own um, selfish concerns. So that this is sort of a good turn to the next question. You know, we've been talking about how higher education is different, and it is different, you know, from a lot of other industries, particularly um, uh, what I'll, I'll call just sort of your typical um, small business or proprietary operation. Um, these aren't widget factories, and they do have complex constituencies, um, like say like alumni and students and faculty and staff who don't always have um, interests that are aligned, et cetera. 
But in some ways, it also would seem that um, higher education is, I don't want to say like any other business, but shares um, some of the considerations and challenges that any business would have. And, and I've said to folks many times, you know, even if you're an institution of higher education, whether you're private, nonprofit, or public, doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you've got two numbers, you know, revenue and expenses that are pretty important. And if, if they're upside down, you can only exist like that for so long, right? Um, so there are certain things that are common. Could you comment a little more when you're working with institutions and you guys are thinking about understanding and improving, you know, operational financial performance? What are the things that are the same as what you have seen in the other industries that you worked in over the years? Well, I think the simple answer for me is that cash is king. The institutions need a positive cash flow to sustain programming and long-term viability. So it's important in our advisory work that we get people focused on the cash. And for some people, that's a, a cultural shift that's difficult to, to get to because they're just kind of focusing on the statement of net assets and other elements within that and not really thinking about the cash flow. So where is the, well, follow the cash and understand how much cash the college or university is actually generating because at the end of the day, as you point out, Aaron, that's really what people are relying on to continue the viability of, a, of an institution. But I, I think the other part of that, as we've already talked about a couple of times, is that there are multiple stakeholders and not always going to be fully aligned. You've got a, a management team, you've got faculty and staff that maybe you could think of as employees, you've got students who think of them as the customers, and you've got alumni who might be analogous to your long-term investors. They all have different interests and different views of what is right and wrong. And let me, and, and you know, Jack, maybe you could just drill down a little more because I, I appreciate that a number of the people who have tuned in today probably are business officers, um, folks who've been uh, in roles where they were, um, you know, who are very familiar with these concepts of cash, et cetera. But maybe you could just explain this, and I don't, I don't mean to sound overly simplistic, but sometimes it, it can be hard for people, I think, particularly in higher ed or other similar spaces, to really wrap their brain around this notion that you could have, you know, $100 million in assets and be on the brink of closure um, because you've got cash flow issues. Could, could you sort of explain that? Um, I, again, I don't mean to be oversimplistic, but I think it, it can be confusing sometimes how that can be the case. Yeah, so I think one way to do that is just be thinking of the statement of cash flows and getting people to understand that just because you have $100 million of net asset, that doesn't mean you have the liquidity to continue operating the business. So get to the bottom line of that statement of net assets and see what the change in cash has been over a 12-month period and where the cash is being absorbed and then start unpeeling that so that you're looking at changes in the revenue, you're looking at changes in the expenses, and using that as an educational vehicle so that you can help people understand, here's part of the problem. The revenue is flat. The expenses are continuing to increase. What categories of expenses are continuing to increase, and how can we make adjustments so that the amount of cash that we're throwing off every year is increasing because at the end of the day, that's what we're measuring. Revenues in excess, of hope, uh, revenues are hopefully in excess of the operating expenses, and that that then provides the framework for then going further into the revenue and helping people understand how revenue can be affected by discounting and by financial aid and. Gee, I, I just don't get the chance. I can't just increase my tuition rates by 5% and expect that 5% is going to come to the bottom line because that 5% is going to get diluted by discounting and it's going to be diluted by changes in the enrollment. So that if I'm moving away from a cohort of international students that were paying 100%, that I'm now moving towards a different 
group of incoming students that are going to be more reliant on financial aid, I have to factor that into my cash flow forecasting. Well, these are all, all just really important concepts. I used to have a, a, a friend and colleague who said, just because I am uh, work for a nonprofit doesn't mean we're for loss. <laughs> And I think there's, there's a lot of wisdom there, right? I mean, you still, you, 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 ideally, you'd like to be making money that you can reinvest. And if you're losing money, um, there's going to come a point where you can no longer advance your mission. Uh, how, let me ask you this. In your experience, and I don't want to pick on our friends in higher education because all of my friends are pretty much in higher education. I can't afford to lose them. But I am curious. You know, do you find, at least among the business officers, I'm sure, you are finding folks who are receptive to these concepts. But to what extent do you do you think there probably is room for education in the higher education space around these core concepts? Uh, and uh, or do you find that the that the sort of literacy around concepts like uh, uh, cash flow, things of that nature is about the same as you see outside of higher education? No, I, I would think that a couple of observations. I think the industry in general is more amenable now to people coming in from outside of higher education. So they bring a kind of a business lens when they assume the role of CFO or senior position within the finance function. So I think that's a decided change for the positive that helps and is indicative of the sector in general looking to improve its performance and realize that the prior models are not going to be successful. I think, though, that there is an opportunity, and this goes back to the CFO level, of helping other people within the university, particularly other members of the university leadership, to understand some of these concepts we've been discussing. And that is something that takes time and it takes a talented CFO and staff to be willing to dedicate the resources and time to do that because it's all it's always then challenging to tell someone they need to learn more about their business when they're concerned about their full-time day job whether that's enrollment management or being the provost and directing the academic content for the entire college or university yeah yeah that's true very well said um, so, you know, we've talked about some of these, uh, what I'll call um, entry-level challenges, aligning constituents and, and, and helping to educate folks as to what the challenges might be. Um, what are some of the most frequent challenges that you have encountered working with institutions of higher education? And do you think that these are different and sort of unique to higher ed, or do you think the types of challenges you're seeing here are similar to those that you see in other industries? I think there is an aspect that is unique to higher education, particularly if you're pushing a message of of improving financial operations. Because um, I think one of the first challenges you run into is people outside of the finance function, just an unwillingness to to really consider changes from past practices and tradition because they don't have the time to think about why do you have to make this change? It's always been this way. It always seems to have worked. Another challenge is as you extend the rollout and the, and the and move beyond the finance function is that there are some very brilliant people in colleges and universities, but my observation is some have very above average abstract thinking skills but less developed pragmatic problem-solving skills. So you have to help people understand what the issues are, what the alternatives can be, and how those alternatives align or potentially in some cases conflict with their interest. And, and the challenge is that certain stakeholders can be territorial and have a silo mentality that decisions are viewed as zero sum games. What's good for you is must be bad for me. Yeah, I'm, I'm, my guess is that there are presidents and chief academic officers and CFOs who are all nodding their heads right now, going, "Boy, tell me about it." 
<laughs> this is, you're describing their daily their daily existence. I mean, how do you do that? Um, uh, not to put it to you, uh, put you on the spot, but is it just an iterative process of education and and you know good presentations, like you said, and lots of information sharing? I mean, uh, any any silver bullets, or is it more uh, something that has to be earned with a lot of hard work? I guess. I think it's mostly in that latter category, but I do think that yeah. there's opportunities to, you know, involve people early on in what you're looking at and why you think it's important and providing a forum for kind of brainstorming early in the process so that people don't feel that you've just delivered the answer to them that they don't have any input on. So yeah. try to look for situations and opportunities to get all the ideas on the table and then then start the vetting process or at least help people understand that here's how we've defined the problem and here are ways that we think we can solve the problem and we've tried to rank order these based on these underlying objectives that we have. So there really is an educational dimension to it. So let me let me ask you this. One thing you haven't mentioned, and I'm, I'll, I'll ask you to start and then I'll, I'll uh, welcome Jacob or Katie to um, mention, but one thing you haven't talked about is the regulatory challenges, right? So I know there are sort of cultural and internal challenges and structural challenges based on the way just higher ed is designed and governance structures often are put together. Um, but then you've got the external challenges because you're dealing with a highly regulated in industry. And, and you know, my experience is those regulatory challenges can arise even when all of your efforts are internal. You know, by no means are they uh, uh, only uh, involved or do they only come about when you're dealing with sort of an external, like a transaction or something like that. So, you know, in your experience, maybe you and again, Jacob and Katie, you guys can all comment on from a regulatory perspective. How much harder is it to get things done and affect change in higher ed? Is it is it a lot harder or maybe not not so hard? What's your experience there? Well, most of them. My efforts have been on what I'll call the operating side, and they're going to be less impacting academic programming. So kind of the, the core operations, while the entire university is subject to regulatory um, governance on a number of different levels, on the operating side, I'm, it's, it's not been as, as much a factor for me, but I'm sure that Katie and, and Jake have a different perspective. But that's but that's really good to know, Jack. I mean, that's interesting. So when you talk about financial and some operational changes, a lot of that can be carried out without triggering, you know, regulatory uh, approvals or processes. In your experience, I mean, that's a really important point. Yeah. So, so I mean, uh, you know, an example would be just helping a college or university understand how they could try to monetize an underutilized asset. Um, unless it's impacting the programming, which often it's not, then that's an easier transaction to complete. Yeah. Whereas trying point. to move into something that, you know, might be a cross-institution collaboration that then starts to impact, you know, who's controlling the academic programming and how does that impact and trip over any academic limitations or regulations is, is a different animal. Jacob, what do you think? So, so, um, pretty different from the transactional experience. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, uh, and I, I'll get into the list in a little more detail on the, the transactional uh, section. But you know, the, the existence of the triad um, delays everything significantly um and you know they have their policies and procedures in place they you know they're they're not going to accelerate um decision making um unless the situation is extremely dire but you know typically uh you're you're going along with their process and if that process is 12 years well i mean 12 months i hope you have 12 months of liquidity if it's 18 yeah, yeah you know it, it, it just it can be infuriating sometimes because you're doing everything you possibly can to, um, you know, uh, you know, save a, a college or university, especially one that's um, in a dire situation, and yet you're you're beholden to to policies and procedures 
that, you know, frankly, you know, are in place and, you know, and can't be circumvented. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it can be very frustrating when you when you do try to execute some sort of substantive change that is a substantive change for your regulators, um, uh, even when everything is done perfectly, theoretically. You know, in that hypothetical, we'll just do was it Einstein-ish stuff? But we'll do a we'll do a, a a mind exercise or whatever where it's all in the hypothetical. Even if you had a hypothetical transaction that was perfect in every way, it would still take six to twelve months to complete. That's just the way it goes, um, and that. To your point, it can be really frustrating if you've got limited runway. Um, so I do want to, Jack. I don't want to dwell. I, I've been yammering a lot here. This is on me. We have a couple more questions for you, but I want to make sure to get to the transactional piece here shortly. But but before we get there, so just I, well, this will be our lightning round. I'll give you one minute for each of these questions. <laughs> so what what or, or whatever? What, what could a CFO at an institution of higher ed do to provide a broader perspective on the institution's financial status? And we've talked a little bit about that, but what do you, what do you see as being effective? Well, I think there's, I guess, three hallmarks that I would focus on. One is to create what we talked about before, kind of a fact-driven, financially oriented process. You know, John Adams famously said, facts are stubborn things. But two parties may disagree on how to address an issue, but it's critical that everyone has the same facts in front of them, at least as a place setter or placeholder at the beginning of the process. Then the other home another hallmark would be transparency. And then the third element would be communication. Yeah. And we're kind of touched on both of those already. Yeah, but you got to get that buy in, it sounds like. I mean that's just so critical is effectively communicating with those constituents and getting buy in so that you can advance um through that governance right. structure and get Get decisions made. So, how can a CFO effectively work to drive change at his or her institution? You know, given all these unique challenges, and I think you've spoken a little bit to this. But anything to add? Uh, I think one item I would add is people are reluctant to change things, but I think the CFO and the financial management team can try to push their colleagues to challenge existing or implied assumptions and take the time to try to imagine or visualize different approaches just because it hasn't been done that way in the past. Can it be done differently? And what would be the implications and ramifications for a given institution? That and kind of asking open-ended questions can sometimes unlock strategic alternatives that can help advance the internal discussion. And it's And it's hard. You know, and I'll say to our, our business officers and CFOs who are listening, I mean, I deeply appreciate, I've worked with um, and, and have as friends some presidents and, and chief academic officers who uh, come from uh, uh, very strongly from sort of the traditional higher ed model. And for them, business can still be a four-letter word. Uh, you know, I mean, they have a pretty negative reaction to the notion of higher ed as a business or industry. And I know when you're a CFO, and you're looking at those, you know, uh, expense reports and, and declining enrollments or whatever other challenges you might be looking at. It can be hard to um, to sort of address that cultural adversity sometimes that is there. Uh, so I'm very sympathetic. One more question for you, Jack. Um, a variety of commentators have discussed that the higher ed business model needs to be updated. And we saw, you know, on the earlier slide from the Inside Higher Ed Survey, nearly 50% of business officers feel like there's something that needs to be revisited or improved. Um, and yet that traditional business model appears to prevail or continue to prevail in a lot of instances, um, at least historically. So do you think now is different? Do you think coming out of the pandemic, we are going to really finally see um, a turning of the corner, so to speak. Uh, I think they, I think we will, and I think it's driven by a number of things, some pandemic related, but some not pandemic related. I think that in certain corners of higher ed, there was probably a longstanding belief that online education or online learning could never achieve the same outcomes. I think that we all kind of learned over the last 15 to 16 months that that was not a correct assumption, that effective learning and teaching can happen through online programming. 
I also think there's a growing recognition among consumers and employers that are sometimes are reevaluating the need for a college degree. And I think you'll start to see more certificate based programs, uh, particularly coming out of the for profit sector, where people understand that maybe they, they don't need four years and a degree in order to get an entry level job, even an entry level white collar job, because what they really need to be successful, whether it's an accounting firm or an insurance company, is the right skills that that employer needs. So I, I think that's another driver. And you'll see see things like that already occurring with companies like Guild Education and their partnership with uh, waste management. But I also think the changing demographics, particularly in the Northeast, as you had pointed out earlier, are causing um, colleges to then rethink what they need to do going forward. And part of that's just going to be driven on the demand side by their students and parents of those students saying, we're not in a position to be taking on five or six figure debt on the hopes that you get a job that's going to be good enough for you to repay those loans particularly if there's other avenues that they can pursue through certificate programs and employer-sponsored education programs. Yeah, great points. Great points. Uh, Jack, any any final thoughts here before we, we transition to transactions? Uh, no, I, I think that covers what I had on, on my mind. Good, good. Good. Well, and I know Jacob's got a lot to say along with Katie. So why don't we, we'll jump right in here to the transactional alternative, right? Um, so I'll ask uh, Jacob, you first, and then Katie interested in your perspective as well. Um, so is there a lot of merger and acquisition activity right now, more or less? I mean, if you've got folks uh, who may be distressed or business officers who are concerned, um, you know, does that, does that put a dampener on things? Um, so what, what do you think the environment's looking like right now and why? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to break this down a little bit into kind of three separate uh, markets. You know, one will be the for-profit, one will be the nonprofit sort of public side of things, and then you know, the private equity universe. Um, on the for-profit side, you know, we've seen um, a, heightened, a heightened appetite from, you know, some of the large public buyers and, you know, uh, solid players on the private equity side with strategic assets in the market. You know, um, you know since the um, you know, election, you know, you, you've seen you know, the, the Admiral Walden deal, Rasmus and the American Public, um, MIAT and UCI, American Sentinel and Post University. You know, that, that those were, uh, you know, it's been a little bit of a, a quick resurgence after, um, you know, a pretty decent amount of, of just pure quiet time. Um, you know, a lot of people were biding their time saying, oh, there's going to be a change in administration. We don't know what's going to happen. You know, I'm uncertain right now. Well, when the, the certainty actually occurred, you know, the risk could be evaluated. And, you know, I think that's why you're seeing that, that, that uptick. Um, we're also, from a strategic perspective, also seeing a resurgence in, you know, foreign interests. You know, getting into the United States, specifically from you know, Europe, India, and South and Latin America. Um, but, so that does contrast a little bit with how the private equity universe is, is viewing this space. You know, obviously, a lot of the you know, headline closures of schools you know, over the last seven or eight years were private equity backed. When you look at Education Corp. of America, Badrock, um, you know, Marinello, and the like, um, you know, it made a lot of private equity investors skittish. But more importantly, it made the lenders skittish. And if the private equity universe is looking at um, uh, these institutions as a platform investment and they can't get lending, you know, it, it's just the, the valuation and the returns just aren't going to work. Um, it, you know, additionally, you know, just with the, the change in administration and, um, you know, uh, 8515, military uh, being out of the 10, uh, uh, gainful employment coming back in some form, the rise of bars, defense, um, 
you know, recent actions regarding, you know, signing of a PGA at the institutional level, um, you know, this has all kind of spooked uh, the private equity universe a bit. However, um, this is one of the most irrationally exuberant M&A markets um, in, in history. Uh, and so as some of these value uh, private equity shops think about their approach and, you know, where can I put uh, my money to work where I'm not paying a double-digit multiple and, oh, yes, we're still in a recession, you know, what business is counter-cyclical? Um, you know, it, it all points to, to higher education. So there has been a resurgence from that area. So it's a little bit like a, a, a push and pull from that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, on the, the nonprofit or public side, you know, you're seeing a renewed uh, interest in some of the smaller groups that were stressed by COVID to really realize synergy, synergies or become uh, more competitive, um, as well as the more progressive thinking universities, seeing what you know, Arizona State, um, you know, University of Arizona, Southern New Hampshire University, and saying, you know what, that has been a massive change for, for those types of institutions. You know, uh, we've got that quality education. I want to be part of it. Um, you know, how can I boost my online offerings? Um, and then, the, you know, the final trend that we're really seeing from a public perspective is on the part of governors you know, some admit admittance that the technical college or community college system is, is failing. Um, and, you know, there, there's not a really a pro, uh, for profit alternative to fill that void. So oftentimes there's uh, a lot of talk about merging those institutions with the four year universities um, to just create a better administration uh, and hopefully put those, those groups on the right. Path. I mean, there, there's been discussions in, in um, Wisconsin and New Hampshire and the like. So, you know, that's a long-winded way of saying, for some strange reason, there's a lot of activity happening right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I completely agree. Katie, what, what are you seeing um, from your perspective? Yeah, I was going to agree. Uh, completely agree with Jacob as well. Um, Jacob, I couldn't tell if you said irrational exuberance or rational exuberance, but I... Definitely irrational. Okay. <laughs> what I was thinking as well, but I would certainly echo the exuberance. We we have a lot going on and, and all kinds of different um, exciting transactions and mergers and schools and companies doing different things and private equity jumping in there too. So... Yeah, I mean, I think it's, from my perspective, a lot of there are the haves and the have-nots coming out of COVID and with the administration change that, you know, I guess we'll see what all will, will happen with that. But there are a lot of schools that maybe shockingly, but as Jacob noted, you know, it's a counter-cyclical business with the economy. And a lot of schools did, had good years last year. People um, maybe left a job they weren't happy with to further their education or ch didn't choose to lose their job but <clears throat> jumped into higher ed and so there's just a lot of a lot of people getting new certificates and degrees and those schools are booming and then there are other schools that are really struggling as a result of COVID you know distance education maybe didn't work for them or maybe they were <laughs> kind of all struggling or ready to get out so you know those are interesting assets to, to a lot of people and maybe they're in need of help and there are some successful school groups or um, other investors who are, are wanting to help them out. Yeah, I think, and I'll just add a couple of things here, but I think you're absolutely right, Katie. It's, that's a great point that, you know, while we started the presentation noting that, you know, nearly 50% of these business officers institutions have real concerns, um, there's another 50% out there. And there are many institutions, either large, well-heeled institutions that will probably always be large and well-heeled, or others that just given how they were situated or their online capability or the programming they offered, um, actually had very good years last year. And, and so it is sort of that haves and have-nots dynamic 
um, that can drive, I think, transactional activity. I'll just offer a couple of additional thoughts. I mean, one thing we're seeing, you know, and Jack, this harkens back to what you were talking about, you know, the distinction between liquid assets and cash, or illiquid assets and cash, rather, is that, you know, there are institutions out there, and I'm first I'll sort of talk about traditional higher ed. I think there are institutions out there, they may be you know, sort of geographically isolated. They may not have any online presence. They may have trouble getting students to their campus, but they have um, wonderful illiquid assets, meaning they're in a beautiful place and they have a gorgeous campus and they may have programming that's unique and extremely interesting and talented faculty and staff, and they're just running out of money. So they can't meet their expenses, but there's a lot that's interesting and positive. And, and those types of institutions, I think, are of potential interest to large, well-heeled institutions that say, you know, there's so many attractive assets here that comprise this school. And even though it's struggling for one reason or another, if we uh, uh, were to engage in some sort of partnership or relationship, we think there could be a really positive outcome. And I think there's a fair amount of that occurring. And the other thing I'll add on the for-profit side, just as a side note, um, that we have seen a fair number of uh, M&A being driven by, and this is a minority percentage, but nonetheless, uh, just by baby boomers who are retiring. You know, you've got folks who, who founded smaller schools um, in the 70s or 80s, and they've run them successfully for 20 or 30 years, and they're now in their 60s or 70s, and they're just ready to move on, you know, uh, and it's just sort of a demographic uh, uh, outcome. Um, so just so many different things that seem to be driving M&A. Um, so again, J Jacob, let me start with you and then and Katie sort of turn to you. What kinds of mergers and acquisitions, given all these different combinations and factors that are driving M&A activity, um, what kinds of mergers and acquisitions do you think are likely to succeed sort of from an operational or, or structural perspective? And then, Katie, I'd be interested, oh, and Jacob as well, actually. I know you do a lot with the regulators. Um, what do you guys think about, from a regulatory perspective, what do you think is most likely to succeed? Yeah. Um, so when, when you're looking at it from an operational perspective, obviously it's what synergies can be realized. You know, are there back office consolidation? Can I maximize campus utilization? You know, leverage my existing footprint. Um, but most of, most of the time, it's all about either optimizing online offerings or bringing a, a particular core program set that uh, may not be present in that university that someone, you know, you get this really specialized, whether it's in technology or nursing or art, you know, uh, making that type of uh, acquisition and bringing that expertise in-house. Um, and so, uh, it's really around those core areas. You know, I, and Katie probably has a lot more insight from the regulatory side of the world, but, you know, from my point of view, um, the regulatory universe always looks at the student first. Um, and if a potential, a potential merger acquisition is not going to benefit the student um, in the long run, it's likely going to get a great deal of scrutiny. Um, and the onus is on, you know, the two entities working together to prove that and prove how this is going to help everyone and yield a better result than both institutions being the same one. But I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over to Katie to talk more about that. Yeah, Jacob, that's a perfect segue into, you know, my main point of what would be successful from a regulatory Perspective is a is a good story and and I mean a, a true story. I'm not saying invented, but um, you know a, a good good narrative to share with the regulators of, of why this transaction makes sense and who who will benefit and um, just the 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 win wins that we can get out of a <clears throat> out of a transaction. Um, I mean, generally speaking, as far as form format of a of a transaction. Obviously, conversions of for-profit to non-profit, those are very few and far between these days. We don't see people really trying to get that done just because of those really high regulatory hurdles. Um, but if it's, you know, one school going to become an additional location of a successful standing school, both are non-profit or for-profit or two nonprofits that are going to merge together and form one bigger, brighter university, um, you know, those are all pretty positive 
uh, very likely to succeed from my perspective um, on the regulatory front. I think the, about, the other thing. Oh, sorry, Aaron. Oh, go ahead. I was I was just going to ask you guys to elaborate just a little more on sort of the conversions and the situation around conversions right now. Um, yeah, well, I'll, I'm happy to. I was going to add just one more thing on, um, you know, when you're looking at from a regulatory perspective, um, you know, the history of outcomes of the college and if that college has a potential of not being a going concern moving forward, and typically that is you know, when you may see you know, the regulatory agencies move a little quicker. No one wants to see a school that was uh, you know, performing its job well go out of business and leave um, you know, the students in the lurch. So I think that uh, you know, it goes part and parcel with saying, you know, how can these two institutions create a benefit? I think when there when there's that worry about a college going out of uh, uh, business, that's also um, uh, a, a, a high point of concern for the regulatory perspective. But from um, your, your question about nonprofit conversion, you know, um, there it, it's almost like you know, that's gone the way of the dodo bird. You know, there were um, some organizations that took advantage of um, of that, and you know, frankly, the department was probably in in the right to take a keener lens, looking at you know whether these nonprofit conversions um, are you know being done for the good of the the, the university or the college, or being done for the good of the shareholder base of the college. Um, but you know, there certainly has been you know uh, uh, a marked lack of those types of transactions being approved. Yeah, like and, and I'll thoughts? just yeah. yeah. I mean, there were just some, as Jacob you know touched on, there were some high-profile schools that uh, did did maybe lack some accountability or or at least. <laughs> The, they were portrayed that way, um, and there are, you know, the department really started cracking down on this notion of schools doing this conversion to avoid um, regulation that uh, a lot of people think for-profits have so much more regulation than the non-profits, which, uh, yes, there certainly are some rules that for-profits have to follow that non-profits don't. Um, in my mind, that's a bit of a misconception. But yeah, that there are pending regulation, federal regulation, that would really um, strengthen the oversight of of approval of those kinds of conversions. So um, I think uh, most people are pretty reluctant to to start down that path at this point. Yeah, I mean, I'll just add for our listeners. I, I think um, when the folks on Capitol Hill right now talk about conversions and and even sort of the comments that were just made. The mind tends to go to, um, you know, the the Grand Canyon transaction or the the University of Arizona, Ashford these or Kaplan, you know, these large, complex, uh, contemplated transactions that involve servicing agreements and and um, and complicated arrangements. And I'm not saying those are good or bad. I'm just saying that's what we tend to think about. But what I do think is worth doing is drawing a distinction between those and many other kinds of conversions that are occurring. Um, I think uh, I won't say they're occurring regularly, but that have also been and will be contemplated. And those are, and it's interesting because there was a letter that went from Scott, uh, Representative Scott over in the House uh, to the Department of Ed not too long ago, where he actually drew this distinction between what, I'm not going to use the term he used, but, you know, <laughs> between what he called sort of, um, uh, the, the way he referred to one of these uh, complicated conversions versus maybe one that doesn't have any kind of service agreement, et cetera. And, and I'll just say we've been involved in some much simpler affairs where, for example, um, a, uh, an institution currently organized as a for-profit that was owned by a trust. Again, you had a baby boomer who wanted to donate the school, wanted out, and wanted to donate the school to a nonprofit so it could just be perpetuated independently. Totally different from the type of thing you know we were just talking about. I've also seen nonprofit institutions where there might be a uh, a, a for-profit entity in town that wants to go 
uh, uh, retire or get out of business, and they say, well, you know, we like that location, we like their student body, and we'd add that as a location if we could. But the consequence is that, you know, that location then becomes nonprofit by virtue of being subsumed into the nonprofit entity. And it's interesting because I don't think historically the department ha and some regulators have um, really had a great sense of how to distinguish among those types of transactions. And I'm hopeful that while there's a lot of conversation around conversions right now, one of the things we will see as part of that conversation is an effort by the regulatory community to draw a distinction, you know, among these types of large, complicated, involved transactions and transactions that really don't fall into that category, but really involve something much more straightforward in the way of, um, you know, what was a for-profit institution being contributed for example, to into a nonprofit at no charge or something along those lines. At any rate, but one thing is for certain, it is a topic of much conversation. If the folks on the line don't know, there has been legislation introduced uh, already um, that would involve reworking the department's change of ownership process with an emphasis on the scrutiny of conversions. There was a GAO report that came out um, in recent months um, being um, not as critical as portrayed in the press, but suggesting that there was, quote, room for improvement of how the department reviewed conversions. Um, and I know the department, as part of the upcoming negotiated rulemaking slate, has suggested that it wants to revisit the change of ownership process, again, with an emphasis on conversions. So it is certainly a topic du jour as they say in Paris, or so I'm told. Uh, in a best case scenario, Jacob, at what point should an institution facing challenges begin to consider a transaction alternative? Um, I mean, I don't mean to sound alarmist, but as soon as you realize that there might be a problem uh, occurring uh, in the immediate future, uh, you know, a, a transaction should be on top of your mind. You don't ever have to go through with it. Um, but what a lot of uh, uh, CBOs and you know operators don't realize is just to get to a purchase agreement or a merger agreement can take six months, and then approval from the regulatory or ed can take you know six to eighteen months. Um, you know before you realize it, um, you may be in trouble, and there's not enough time uh, to save you. So you know a lot of the uh, a lot of times you even smell um, uh, a concern, reach out to your advisor. That's, you know, legal accounting, restructuring, you know, just get their formal assessment. You know, these assessments are usually, you know, at no cost. You know, just get an opinion. Everyone's got a lot of anecdotal historical perspectives um, that can be really helpful for your future decision making. Um, it may set you on the right path or may, you know, sound the alarm and say, get moving. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, c I couldn't agree more. Go ahead, Katie. Yeah, no, I was just going to add that from a regulatory perspective, you know, we always say we love to have enough fun that, uh, you know, everybody's comfortable and, and we know we can accomplish all the goals of, of bo both parties, all sides. Um, and as I'll get into a little bit, I think, in the next question, there's just the regulatory processes can, can take a long time. We, it's, it's unclear sometimes with some of the agencies, especially some of the or even the department at this point, how long it'll take to get responses back on things. So, yeah, as early in the process as you can get counsel involved and, you know, other folks, it's, it's great to kind of work through those things early as early as you can. Yeah, well, and that kind of takes us to the next question, Katie. So, you know, I mean, what do you think? Uh, I know you work on a lot of transactions. Um, how much time is, does it take to complete a transaction in, in higher ed? Well, my my first sentence is everyone's favorite sentence from a lawyer, that it depends. But, of course, it does. So, you know, if you are talking about a regional accreditor, a lot of times when I'm – a timeline for a client who is initiating a transaction to think through um, when we can actually close and, and finalize the change, um, we start with that regional accreditor. So those, you know, I'd say usually for regional, it's, it's a one-year process, maybe 18 months. Aaron, as you know, we're working with someone now, and they've kind of said it might be up to two years for, for that. Now, that's an outlier, thank goodness, but 
um, yeah, you know, I'd say if you're not regionally accredited and we're talking about some of the national accreditors, they still can have long timelines, but usually with them, we set the longest point in the timeline with the U.S. Department of Education, which I think right now we're saying we're seeing um, kind of a final response, we say, in six to nine months um, total, hopefully less. But right now, uh, you know, you just kind of have to give that bigger runway. So sometimes people come to us and say, look, we, we got to close in two months. What, what can you do? And, and we just have to squeeze as much as we can in there and maybe sometimes close without some approvals. But uh, ideally, you have enough runway for it to take about six to nine months, I'd say. Yeah. Jacob, what do you think? You, you guys see a lot of transactions. What's your, what's your sort of sense on timing? Well, when I originally saw this question, I kind of laughed because, uh, you know, kind of along with Katie's answer, I think if you ask 12 different advisors in the space, you'd probably get 12 different answers um, because everyone's got, you know, really their, their own experience. You know, I've seen deals that have bypassed regulatory altogether um, that have taken three months. And then I've seen deals that have taken eight months, for eight, 18 months for no reason whatsoever. Um, so it, it, it's very um, it's very hit or miss. Um, I feel like that the, you know, the lack of you know a strong communication from the department on the policy is sort of adding to that. You know, especially when you know folks are confused by you know the different time periods that are required versus the abbreviated or comprehensive review po uh, process with with the department. Um, you know, and then you know Katie had mentioned a, a bit with you know regionals taking. Uh, a much longer time, and you know, it, it is regional specific too. You know, you, you, you've got you know, some of the more progressive bodies like WASP and Middle State that are going to move a lot faster than your HLCs or your SACs. Um, so, um, you know, it, it, the, the, the short answer is I'm going to go back to the beginning. It depends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I agree completely. I mean, I think the only certainty is. It takes longer than it takes to sell a widget factory or anything in an unregulated, right? I mean, it's just to do a transaction in the higher education space, especially, you know, when you're talking about larger complex institutions, um, it just takes a lot of time. And what that means is, to your earlier point, Jacob, you, you have to start early, um, as early as possible, if you want to get through the transaction, uh, particularly if you've got a party that's experiencing some financial distress um, and may have a limited runway, as they say. Um, so, Katie, I'll start with you on this one again, and then, and then Jacob, very interested in your thoughts. From a regulatory perspective, is it getting harder to complete transactions in the higher education space, maybe setting aside conversions, because we've already talked about all the scrutiny around those, but just more in general. Is it getting harder, um, and do we think that differs what – you know, depending on whether we're talking about uh, traditional uh, two institutions, uh, uh, two private nonprofits, for example, versus uh, two institutions that might be um, proprietary or, you know, cross-sector. Well, of course, Aaron, there are several things to consider here when we when we talk with schools or investors we have the difficulty of getting the necessary approvals lined up for a change. Um, if we back up a bit, you know, under the previous administration, the U.S. Department of Education lost a lot of staff members, um, some retired, some just left, and in a lot of those cases, those positions then were, were never filled under the last administration. So at the same time that that was happening, the department also started taking a much more involved view of And we ended up in a place where the department is doing a far more robust review and less staff to complete that review. So we started seeing the timing on responses really start to lag over the last couple of years. Um, the few folks that are left answering our calls, I will say, are working very hard at the department. Ten years ago, I would have said a government job was nine to five, but now we've got people in the department sending emails all hours of the night to us. So uh, all of that is to say that this increased scrutiny coupled with less staff which really hampered schools and investors and, and their council's ability to anticipate timing on the pre-acquisition review response from the department. Um, under the current administration, 
we are hopeful that they will staff that back up, um, you know, using a very broad generality. Democratic administrations don't usually shy away from hiring and staffing up the government. So we expect that the number of staff will increase, and with that, we hope for quicker turnaround on some of these um, pre-acquisition reviews. Uh, at the same time, there's new legislation aimed at institutional changes, as Aaron mentioned, um, and you know that includes contemplation of uh, fee structure for the department's review process. So that you know, no fee seems preferable, but if there was a fee, we believe it tie the department more closely to a specific timeline. Um, I think most of our clients would be willing and even happy in some cases to pay a fee in exchange for a little more certainty on the process with the department. So the bottom line for me is there, there's still a lot of uncertainty. So we also need to consider kind of what kind of transaction we're talking about. Um, if this is an extremely complex corporate structural change, that will look really different when compared to a straightforward, um, you know, for-profit school company acquiring another for-profit school with programs that align. Um, when you're talking about two schools coming together with little to no overlap in their programs or mission or a company is acquiring some parts of a school but not others, um, perhaps a for-profit being acquired or merging with a nonprofit, it just gets complicated quickly. And I'd say all agencies, including the department, of course, but including accreditors, both institutional and programmatic, um, the state agencies that schools are beholden to will ask a lot more questions. And that is, of course, likely to increase the time required for review. Um, we've seen agencies hire, even hire outside counsel to help them parse through corporate change questions and then pass those costs on to the school or our clients. So, We've seen huge delays as agencies contemplate these changes um, on and on. I, I will also say, however, that many agencies are much more comfortable with these processes. They have sophisticated procedures and straightforward time for some agencies because they've done so many of them at this point. So it, it does really kind of cut both ways. It's really a mixed bag. Um, with this kind of huge uptick that we talked about at the top of the hour, including with traditional schools and transactions, it's probably good that the department is kind of going through that exercise of revising their review process. Um, and I'd say setting aside politicized transactions that, you know, we read about in the news. Generally, transactions are doable. Um, as we've mentioned, we are working on lots of them. Um, and of course, like I said, it's just a mixed bag of how things will go moving forward and how changes will be implemented implemented with <clears throat> the, the different agencies. Um, Jacob, I don't know, I, that was a lot from me, but <laughs> do you feel like um, it's getting harder in the higher ed space or? Well, I mean, my first example is probably, the first transaction I ever did was you know, back in, in 2002. Um, so I've been covering this space for uh, going on 18 years. And, and back then, you know, the, the day we took it to market, the day it closed was 90 days. Um, I, you know, w was that the right approach? Probably not. Uh, but boy, do I miss those days. Um, it, it's definitely gotten harder since then. Um, you know, and, and probably uh, you've seen uh, it really get harder just in the last you know, four or five years. You know, even in 2014, you could get something done pretty quickly. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, now you're, you're in it for the long haul. When you're, when you're, you know, getting involved in a transaction, you mentally have to prepare yourself that this is going to be 12 months or 18 months um, uh, at, you know, at minimum. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I do, I do long for the old days and, you know, the saying we always have is time kills all deals. And so if you're taking, you know, what was a three to six month process and making it 12 to 18, you know, that does, you know, hurt the, um, you know, really the, the percentage, uh, likelihood of closure. Um, but, uh, 
you know, I'm, I'm hoping as the department is able to step up and replace a lot of, um, you know, the folks that they lost uh, uh, during the, the Trump administration, that that just gets back to some sort of normalcy. Um, you know, they're, they're working their butts off. Um, uh, it, it's, it's not for, for a lack of effort. It's really for a lack of manpower. Um, and, and some increased scrutiny, which, you know, given some of the, the closures over the last um, five or six years, it is warranted. Um, uh, but uh, it, it is much harder in in this sort of Title IV, you know, university college space. When you're talking about higher education, you know, service or product or technology providers, it is so much easier. You know, I was talking about it irrationally, the exuberant market before. You know, deals are getting done in record time, and uh, you know, multiple that are, you know, much more than companies are worth. Um, and I think a lot of this was, you know, really spurred by the forced innovation um, uh, from COVID, especially with online and digital learning. You know, COVID advanced the creative thought um, within the higher education space by probably about five years. It's kind of akin to pushing someone um, off the deep end of the swimming pool and say, hey, you better stay afloat or swim. Um, and, you know, you, you need to adopt that, that change. And, you know, even though you're seeing that, that, that change within the product, service, and technology providers, when you think about it from the actual college or university providers, it was a little bit of the same that way. And, you know, certainly on the nonprofit um, and public side, you know, those groups that were barely surviving, you know, COVID was that impetus to say, well, we got to think a little bit different if we want to survive in the next 10 years. Yeah, great. All great points. All great points. Um, so we're getting close. It's 326, actually, uh, to the end of the hour. We've got some resources we'll just highlight very quickly. Um, we have our blog. We always welcome folks to check it out. Uh, and we actually have several new pieces that we've been working on and we hope to get up. We've been quiet for a little while, just very busy this past spring. Um, let's see, we have our webinars that are on demand. So this webinar, pretty much all of them that we offer uh, throughout the firm can be accessed free, no charge, on demand at your convenience at our uh, TCLE library. Um, we, I'll just highlight for those of you that are institutions, if you are complying with the new Title IX rule, newish Title IX rule from last summer actually, um, we do have a six part totally free on YouTube six part training series that you can use to train your Title IX professionals. Um, and we have some compliance materials, and that link up there is, uh, again, live, and if you click on that, we've got a checklist and some other things that you can check out. Um, also, for those of you who may be thinking about Title IX, there are probably new rules coming fairly soon, so keep an eye out for that as well. Um, if you are involved in financial reporting to the department under the existing bar defense rule, we have a reporting guide for you here that you can access by clicking on that link. And it, once again, this is an area that the department is probably going to revisit in the next year or two. Um, and then finally, just our disclaimer uh, that this is all for informational purposes only. Uh, and with that said, um, I'm actually looking at our Q and A box. I will tell my panelists. I think you you did such an excellent job, and we're so thorough and are so uh, overwhelmingly brilliant that we don't have any questions today. So I think um, most of what folks were probably thinking, we probably got too. Uh, and that's the benefit of a wide ranging conversation. Um, really appreciate again, Jack and Jacob, you all being here today with us and appreciate all our listeners joining in. And one last time, I'll just make a pitch. If you have a second, fill out the survey. Uh, we always appreciate hearing back from um, so with that having been said, to everybody, we wish a uh, safe and uh, happy and well afternoon, and uh, keep an eye out for our next webinar. Bye, everybody.